part of Americans of four pieces. Uh, Fabrinaldi, <clears throat> who used to have the Maritime, still works for Bendix. He's now a regional manager for the Northeast. Uh, both Wayne and I report up to uh, to Fab, so Fab's got responsibility for Ontario, Quebec, the Maritimes, and then east of the Mississippi, right up to the Carolinas. <clears throat> so in the process of that shuffle, uh, Wayne Thomas now is the new territory account manager for Atlantic Canada. Right, so uh, leave the screen up for a few minutes if you can grab his email address and his contact phone number. All things related to Bendix, be it sales, technical support, be it distributor, fleet, um, falls onto Wayne. So feel free to reach out to him. Wayne's going to be with us. He's going to be monitoring the chat room, looking for questions. <coughs> All right, we'll begin. So again, thank you for the opportunity to come and talk about uh, Bendix Wingman Fusion. Some of the key technologies um, revolve around you know, the inclusion of electronic roll stability, uh, go through lane departure, obviously the Wingman Fusion system itself, and active steering. Right, so all those four bullet points that I've got listed are all integral to make the collision mitigation system work. So why collision mitigation? Basically, if we look at uh, the latest FMCSA data, right, we're trying to take what could have been a fatality, move it to an injury, what could have been an injury, move it to property damage and near miss, right? So this data really is derived from you know, accident information. This isn't new. Uh, the big gizmo just came out and, and the OEM was stuck around their truck. It's been an ongoing shared development program, at least in our case, um, for production itself began in 2008. And I think most of us kind of remember the old Eden Borat, that 77 gigahertz orange eyeball, if you did. Um, so that began the evolution of a passive system. Right? So I'm going to talk about passive and active systems. Active systems are collision mitigation and the system intervenes and applies and brakes. Passive systems are those systems that are on these safety vehicles that warn the driver. Don't immediately put the brake on by themselves, but they're an advisory kind of system. So if we go back to 2008 with what we had called Wingman ACB that was adapted for braking, and then 09 and 010, we released uh, Wingman Advanced, which now included uh, adaptive crews with braking, and then it just evolved. These technologies are very much like our cell phone. Right? Every 18 months, we have more reliable hardware. The computing power doubles, triples. Uh, so we have more computing power, uh, larger storage capacity. And the system simply improves and improves. We find ourselves in 2021 today at the cusp of, uh, by next year, it's a change in new radars and new camera systems. And then if you look out to 2024, you're going to start to see more of an electrification of the traditional little air brake system. We start at the air dryer, and then we have GSPC systems coming 2024, which is the first leg into brake by wire. It's, it's uh, some pretty significant changes that are coming. So again, so with these systems, we go back to 2008 when the first radar systems came out, this 2075-25 rule. Uh, both NHTSA and FMCSA had kind of commissioned the studies at the University of West Virginia, went to some of the fleets who had begun adopting these collision mitigation technologies and said, listen, look at your population of trucks that don't have that collision mitigation versus the ones that do. Look at a route, in this case, I think it ran north of San Francisco into Seattle in over an 18, 24 month period of time. And basically with a basic radar system, right? This is well below what we're gonna talk about today. There's a noted reduction in rear end collisions by 75%. And of the 25% that did occur, a reduction of about 70 to 75% in cost. So there's a marked improvement when we include these radar collision mitigation systems. So there's a, a real benefit for it. So listen, I'm gonna start with this video. I'm hoping that the feed will get an idea of what's happening. And then I'm gonna finish with this video. And then actually there'll be a one question quiz at the end of this thing. It's kind of fun. So let me kind of start off here, what we're seeing, right? Oncoming traffic, nice clear day. I hope that video feed came through. So let's, this is a placeholder. We're gonna come back to this towards the end of the video again. All right, so we're gonna talk about Bendix Wingman Fusion. Uh, the key uh, characteristics of the technology are try to mitigate and minimize the potential for rear end collisions, run off the road accidents, slight swipe crashes, and then of course active steering. There'll be two key messages with this slide. Most important that you walk away from this today, especially for those fleets who are potentially considering doing collision mitigation technology, introducing it to the fleet, or you have it and you're just rolling it out. The main message to the drivers has to be, 
An inclusion mitigation system does not replace the need for a skilled, alert, professional driver reacting appropriately in a timely manner. Right? So uh, these things don't take over for the driver, right? The laws of physics come into play. They can be driving too fast, uh, running too heavy, too high of a CG, right? the vehicle can tip over to come into a curve too quickly and the ESP can't react, right? So the driver is always ultimately um, you know, in charge and responsible for the safe conduct of that vehicle. But the collision mitigation systems kind of step back in the background. So at that one point where the four-wheeler jumps in front and slams on the brake, right, the driver notices the action, his brain's got to react, he has his foot moving, stabs on the brake pedal, it's 45 milliseconds for the brake to come on. Right? I've already come onto the brake and began that braking process. Right? That's just an example of it. So collision mitigation sits off in the background. It also establishes a set of boundaries and guidelines around the vehicle. And in some cases, it'll change some driver behaviors. So again, important for the drivers to understand, this is not a replacement, right? This is ADOS, it's an advanced driver assistance system, but it's a driver assistance, not a driver replacement technology. All right, we begin with the hardware. So I'm showing here a camera radar and then the main EC brake controller. We call our Fusion because we're one of the only systems that integrate not only the data that's coming off the camera, but also the data that's coming off the radar. So I've got two sources of data when, it, when the vehicle has to establish or try to determine an action that takes place due to an event that's happening or unfolding in front of the vehicle. So I'm getting data from the radar and the camera being processed through the ABS brake control. All right, so let me start with the lane departure camera, right? Mounted up in the windscreen or up in the windshield. Uh, you know, ensure the drivers, there's no secret lens pointing back at them. It's a forward facing camera only. From a Bendix perspective, this is our most mature technology. It goes back to 2004 when we acquired Icaris. We have the lion's share of lane departure business globally. Uh, what makes us a little unique is that we've written, right from the outset, it's written in uh, machine language. So it's got AI capability. So the Fusion camera spends 99.8% of its time doing a lane departure feature, right? So it's also talking with the radar, but let me start with what lane departure exactly is. And here again is a little quick video. I'm hoping the speed comes through. This is actual footage coming off of uh, a development computer. Halt it right here. So what the camera is doing, right, is we're looking for the lines on the left, right side of the road. So we're situationally positioning that vehicle within the center of that road. So as the driver is going, right, and here's an example. Watch the little X's that show up. And again, I hope it shows up. So in this example, we're showing the driver didn't use a signal line. So the minute the vehicle crosses the line, the width of the front tire crosses that line, they'll get an electronic rumble strip sound. That sounds basically something like this, right? A little bit loud, it's annoying, but it's meant to be. So we don't keep the driver confined to, you know, the, the discrete markings on the road. We essentially will allow the width of the tire or the center line of the rear board to cross the line before we give the driver an alert. And the sensitivity of that, we, we ship it by default, essentially the width of the front tire, but there's some sensitivity adjustments you can make with the software, it's very straightforward. But here again, you know, what I hear from drivers, and we've been, I did lane departure long before collision mitigation rolled into play, and very few drivers complain about it because it's very accurate, doesn't do false alerts, but it does that thing where if they start to get sleepy and drowsy, and they start bouncing off the lanes, and that lane departure system starts going off, you know, in short order, they get used to it, you know, time to go off road and take a So again, what the camera's doing, it's monitoring the position of the vehicle. Now, uh, of course, we have snowy, crappy conditions. So if we get into a circumstance where left side is all slushy, I can see a little bit of the, of the painted lines, but the right side is completely covered in snow and slush, the driver does not get an alert. Depending on the HMI or the electronic dash in the vehicle, we'll typically see a little circle at the bottom of the, the speed indicator on that screen with two parallel lines. And those two parallel lines, right side and left side, will drop off. So the camera loses the right side and show the driver a monitor in one side or a monitor in the other side. So the system, the only time it will alert is when we get into construction. Now we have that situation where we have painted lines that are crisscrossing the roadway. And now the camera basically pops up along it, doesn't know where it's going, and it starts to alert. So second, uh, second point, make sure that before you give the keys to the driver, make sure they know where the momentary kill switch is for this. Right? So again, it's when they get into construction, there's multiple painted lines. The camera can't determine where it is. 
there's a momentary switch. And it varies on different OEM platforms. Volvo has it up by the CB up in the headliner. Um, now Star can peak. They're down right underneath the yellow button um, of the MV3. But there's a momentary switch. The picture of a truck, and I've got a slide later. So they hit that momentary switch. We disable the alerts. The system's still working in the background. Disables the alerts for 15 minutes, then the system winds up and starts working again. It's still in construction, the lanes are all wonky, and the system alerts, they hit the button. Now, fleets will go, well, geez, they're going to turn the thing off all the time. Well, they won't, because it doesn't alert all the time. You know, under normal operating conditions, excluding this construction issue with the painted lines, as long as the driver stays within that line uh, and doesn't venture out too far right, too far left, the system doesn't block. So universally, it's been a well-accepted and very reliable system. The cameras have improved, and you'll see how the camera plays a major role when we get into more collision mitigation. But that camera, that's what it's doing. Lane departure warning, so message one, make sure that the drivers understand, know where that uh, switch is located. So I just want to do a quick spot check, Mark. Can you hear me okay? And the video's coming through good? We're good, Wayne. Or, uh, Pierre, sorry. Yeah, everything's yeah. coming fine. Good, thanks. All right. Now, some additive features of the link of the camera. So now we do overspeed alert. So these are some functions within uh, Bendix Fusion. Uh, it ships by default turned on. Um, I have probably 18, 19% of my fleets who turn it off, right? They just uncheck a box of the software. So what this does is that it's, as the vehicle's driving, it'll look for a sign. This is not like the database we have in our GPS Garmin units in our car, right? So it gives us an indication of what the speed is and where we are, right? So that's Garmin looking at a database that says your position on this highway says that the speed should be 100 kilometers an hour, and it posts that little symbol. This is the camera as the driver's going down the road, irrespective of where they are. They could be in construction, we have reduced road speed, school zones, for whatever reason. The camera spots the speed sign and it immediately compares to what the vehicle, actual vehicle speed is. And if the vehicle, and it, it, of course, can vehicles, it'll spit out in kilometers per hour. If you're crossing the border, you know, it'll flip back between miles and kilometers. Um, so if you're five miles over the limit, we'll give the driver an overspeed alert. So on the HMI, the electronic dash, boop, they'll get a little more. We'll get a message with a tone that says overspeed alert. There's some message similar to that, depending on the OE. If the vehicle is 10 miles an hour over the speed limit, Again, you know, the, it's not that this alert keeps popping. It's when the camera sees the sign, we give them the alert. Five mile over the limit, it's just a warning alert. Ten mile over the limit, we give them the alert. Plus, we pull the throttle back for one second. We pull the engine back to idle, and then we do a modified torque curve and give them the power back again. So there's a haptic alert above 10 miles an hour. Again, with the software, you can modify what those delta speeds are. But by factory default, five is the warning, ten is the warning, plus the one second throttle pull to really warn the driver. They can continue going and over speeding, but that action will take place every time the camera spots a speed sign. So that's the overspeed alert, and that's the work that the cameras do. And again, there's more features coming, but that's basically the function of the lane departure within the fusion context. So next we have the radar, right? Up in this fit picture I'm showing, I've got the camera up here in the windscreen, the center of the window. About half the vehicles built today have the camera mounted in the center of the window. The other half are offset to the passenger side by six inches. Not a big deal, but just to let you know. And then our radar is mounted down here in the bumper line, right? So these vehicles that are built, right, I provide the hardware and the algorithm, and then we spend two years with each individual OE with a variety of their chassis qualifying how this system is going to work. So I'm talking about collision mitigation with you today. The back end of this system runs on ESP for electronic stability, right? So that was mandated in 2017 under CMDSS 136. So the ESP system works for the stability, with the yaw sensors and the lateral accelerometer, right? So they're key to the vehicle, the integration of the radar, its location and position is important. So I, I kind of put this in there as a reminder of myself. If we, you're- uh, We do have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Jump in for a sec. Um, we got we got somebody asking reading signs of miles per hour and kilometers per hour. How does the system know the difference? So if I'm in Canada and I cross the border into U.S., right? So I've been reading 100. I'm going to use these sample numbers. I'm reading 100 kilometers an hour. Also, I get into a roadway that says 55. It'll take about three or four kilometers. It'll realize, and then it'll flip over to imperial values. And then conversely, when it crosses back a border again, so. It's an algorithm that we use for the TRW created, works very well. 
So it's usually three to five kilometers. I'll let Wayne chime in if I'm off here, but usually within 10, 15 minutes of crossing the border, the system really, there's also a method with all the OEMs, they provide the ability that the driver can manually go in and do it. But um, yeah, rarely does that happen. You just wait for the system to recognize. So the way we're doing it electronically, again, is that delta in speed, the immediate change in speed, that's how we determine uh, MPH to cage. Okay. Um, yep, so, good. okay, good. So the bumpers, key point, right? I did my, my job through Atlantic Canada, big moose, big problem. So if you have moose bumpers, not a problem. And I'm going to distinguish between a moose bumper and a cow catcher or a deer bumper. So a moose bumper typically is a bigger heavy duty one, right? It's, it's integral, um, right? So in that case, obviously we can't have any obstructions in the front of the radar. So the bumper or the radar itself can be removed and moved forward. Of the big moose bumper providers that I've worked with, like guys like Magnum, Ali Arc, um, trying to think, Nick Mac, I've worked with six or seven of them. Right? And so they've all provided the ability to accommodate a collision mitigation radar. Um, but there's a caveat, right? You just can't go in, remove this radar, and jump it on the moose bumper. So because with the Bendix system, our camera and the radar are talking together, right? I got a dedicated backbone, a twisted pair that runs. Obviously, I'm connected to J1939, but I also have a dedicated CAN communication from the radar up to the camera. So this dimension, which is the, the lens to the face of the radar, it's called a longitudinal dimension. If you move the radar out, ensure that your installing dealer uh, grabs our software and does the specific measurement changes, right? It's, it's, I don't want to get in how to do it, but reach out to Wayne Thomas. You can talk with the tech. It's a quick little thing, but we have to ensure that when we move that radar forward, that we make the adjustments to the software so the system functions correctly. If you're going to do a deer catcher, which just integrates and mounts without much modification, my message to you today is make darn sure that the bumper provider that you're getting, and get it in writing, most of them have it on their sales brochures, that their bumper design is radar compliant. I'll show you a slide here in a few minutes, but basically the radar signal that comes out is a transceiver and a receiver. The radar signal that gets pinged out is shaped like an ice cream cone. But the basic function of a radar signal it's not a clean, a clean cone. It's got wisps of, I call it little fire flames that come off the side. That's just a function of a radar signal. And if that, one of those little wisps of radar signal bounces off that steel bumper any way, shape, or form, the system will immediately react to it, thinking there's a vehicle on its path, and you'll get, a, I call it a little break event. So just make sure any bumper you put on that's going to get close to the radar, that that bumper supplier provides you with some written thing that says it's it's you know radar compliant. At that point, they've reached out to us and they've reached out to the other radar providers, and it's basically the size of the hole. So the more sensitive the radars get, the larger the hole gets. All right. So bumpers, radar. The other point I want to mention real quickly is the windshield. So you have to be kind of not well careful. <clears throat> so the camera itself is stuck to the windscreen. Uh, and the day will come where you'll have to replace the window. A couple of things, they'll have to replace the bracket. And don't try to reuse the bracket and put two-faced tape on it. The little shadow line is going to be too great, and the camera will pop up along enough function correctly. But the message today is that some aftermarket uh, windshields, right? So when you look at a windshield, there's a slant to it, right? There's a pitch to the windshield or several dimensions, but it's, if you think of it on three axes, if the angle is off, right, so you get an aftermarket window that's not quite formed correctly, the cameras are sensitive to two tenths of a degree. If that windshield wasn't formed correctly, you're going to get error codes out of the camera. So just a cautionary note, when you're replacing glass, make sure you get a good quality vendor uh, with the glass, and they're going to guarantee you that it's compliant for lane departure warning systems. It's not just our camera. Uh, Takata has the same requirements. So. There's a few other vendors out there. So again, uh, just a cautionary note, we're doing service, make sure you have you know, good quality windshields in them so that we get the curvature correctly. So radar, um, how does the radar work? So this is not the scale, right? Again, just a reminder, radar's down here, camera's up in the windshield. This little graphic, not the scale, but it gives you an idea. Right? So this cone out here is what the radar is looking at. You see out 500 feet. And then this is a viewing angle, essentially, of the camera. It's kind of funny when I look at this, because the new cameras have a wider field of view than the ones that are coming out, and they go 18 months or even wider. But this is representative of what the truck is doing. Go ahead, what's that? Pierre, it's Wayne. I don't see the presentation at this moment. Okay. 
Is anybody else? Mark, do you see it on your end? Yeah, I can see it on my end. Yeah, Wayne, I think you got connectivity. You talked about that earlier with Outlook. Yeah. Well, I'll check and see. I'll reconnect. Okay. All right. So I'm going to continue. Mark, you let me know if uh, any issues come up on your side of it as well. So what we're looking at is the essentially what the system's looking at. So the radar, what does the radar do? The radar will see independent of the conditions outside. I can see through snow, ice, fog, rain, right? I'm driving. I can barely see the past the nose of the truck, but the radar can see through it. Obviously, if I get a bunch of snow and slush and crap in front of the nose of the truck, when the radar gets blocked, I need about the diameter of a toonie before I lose uh, and the transceiver can't send a signal out. The driver will get a message on his dash that says radar block. And it says covered with snow, you get no collision mitigation and you won't have cruise control. You don't want them using cruise control in bad weather anyway. But. Okay, so the radar can see out your perspective. But the camera doing the lane departure feature has a wider field of view, and, but you know it can only see what the driver sees. So if the driver's got limited visibility and he can only see this far, that's as far as the camera can go. It's important, I'll get back to that in two slides. So let's work and talk about the radar. So the radar does two things. It does adaptive cruise, and obviously it does collision mitigation. That does all the work. And all the, the things that I'm gonna talk about today, the final decision for a collision mitigation event is determined by the radar, and it's gonna be the driving decision maker to put the brakes on automatically. So the radar is looking out 500 feet, and let's assume in this example, I'm gonna do adaptive cruise example here. My truck is doing 100 kilometers an hour, and this vehicle is doing 90. So the truck begins to approach the truck. The radar picks up this target vehicle ahead. I'm the host, he's the target. When the radar picks it up, it notes the delta in speed and it will slowly slow the truck down. Right? So the driver is in cruise control. Let me just emphasize that. So the driver is in cruise control. He's set at 100, car's doing 90. Radar picks it up. We'll start to rubber band and slow the speed down on the tractor. We'll pull throttle or reduce throttle. If the rate of deceleration or the closing rate is, is fairly high, then we may uh, throw the engine brake, if so equipped. And so then now my truck will equalize at the same speed of the car ahead. So the goal is to maintain a certain following distance, and I'll show you what those are, between this car. And it's not abrupt, right? So if the formula slows down a little bit, I'm not going to slam the brake on the truck to maintain this hard following distance. I rubber band. I'll get a little closer to him. I'll back off. And a lot of drivers will tell you, you know, geez, I was driving, I was set at 100 clicks. Next thing you know, I look down, I'm doing 90. I caught up a car that was going slower. So it's not that noticeable. But within the adaptive cruise, and when I'm in cruise control mode, I have the option of modulating throttle, applying the engine brake if needed. And I'll put on about one third of air brake if needed, if that rate or the closing rate gets too quick. Right? So that's the function of the radar. So that's in the adaptive cruise mode. <coughs> um, now when I get into a collision mitigation, so I'm not in cruise, or even if I'm in cruise, it really doesn't matter. For whatever reason, if this four-wheeler slows down abruptly, uh, separate this zone into three. So we have first alert for the driver, right about here. Again, it's not the scale, I'm just giving you an idea. So this would be the first alert. I give the second alert to the driver, and then finally, this is uh, accident is imminent. So I'm gonna go show you a scale. Don't get lost with all the numbers. Right, these are all the different configuration codes that are available with the Bendix system. Each OEM has chosen, has fallen into a configuration code that they've chosen that they offer to the fleets. Right? You're sitting with your new truck salesperson, and um, you know, for example, one is Kenworth Peterbilt, they've fallen onto these operating parameters. Three is Navistar, five is Volvo Mac. So each one of these has some slight nuances to it. But you got nine different ones to choose from. So I've got some fleets who have fallen on that use exclusively number eight. And it's a whole different discussion. So they can pick and choose. And I got fleets that have multiple name plates and they may have different operating conditions, but while the trucks are being PDI, they all settle in on one configuration code. It's two strokes of a computer keyboard and you change your configuration code. Well, let me go through this really quick so that it'll make sense as I go through the rest of the presentation. I'm gonna focus on number three. So configuration code number three, I talked about the three alerts, first alert, second alert, and then the third warning alert collision is imminent. So in this case, uh, when the target is two seconds away, we use time, not distance, right? So time is more important because the, the faster I'm going, the greater the distance, the slower I'm going, the shorter the distance. So at two seconds, and you notice there's an asterisk up here. If you're under configuration code number three, that means I'm gonna suppress alerts below 60 kilometers an hour. So if I'm driving in town and I'm bumping around in traffic, my first two seconds away is not gonna give the driver an alert and warning. 
if he gets closer to 1.5 seconds, then I'm going to start giving the driver the medium alert. So this alert is like beep, beep, beep. The second alert, the volume doesn't change, but it's now beep, 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 right? So it becomes more aggressive. And then the fast audible alert, it's one long tone. There's usually a warning message that shows up on the dash. So first alert, second alert. And that's what these collision mitigation systems are doing. With the Bendix system, we're always trying to warn the driver to you know, maintain this distance between the target vehicle and the host vehicle. So that's first alert, second alert, third alert. And this column over here, this is the default. This is the, the distance that I have, oops, right up here, the three, when I throw cruise control on. So if I'm running on the highway, this 2.8 seconds is the default following distance that I'm going to have to the vehicle ahead. I'm doing 100 kilometers an hour, I'm going to maintain 2.8 second following distance. We can see there's you know a variety of mixes, the shortest being 1.7, the longest being 3.5. So, you know, this is a configuration code chart I'll go through with fleets if drivers come in and, oh, it's too noisy, uh, four wheelers are cutting in front of me. We go through and review the configuration code they're set up and we can pull some levers and, you know, ameliorate what we've got going on. So that's what this, this thing is meant to represent. We've got first alert, second alert, constantly trying to alert the driver. Uh, and then this orange zone here, it's about the car length and a half to the vehicle. You know, the worst case scenario with this is we got a four-wheeler from ripping down the side of the truck and they just, like, this never happens, right? Yeah, I decided this is the exit where they need to go. They come ripping in front of the front of the tractor and grab that exit. So that's probably the worst case scenario. So you can see what's happening. I've got a four-wheeler ahead. The radar's detected it. It's rubber banding. It's doing a distance calculation. When that four-wheeler cuts out and all of a sudden the radar spots a vehicle very close to the front of the truck, the alerts happen instantly, and there's a quick deceleration. The amount of brake that we give comes down to a whole bunch of characteristics, like velocity of the forward vehicle, speed, adhesion utilization. But you know that's the one that gets the drivers freaked out the first time that happens to them. So if they don't happen to notice this car coming down, or they start don't catch this action of the vehicle cutting in front of them, the system won't react. Okay, so. That's how we have the radar. The radar always does the, uh, the main work for determining if uh, collision mitigation event is gonna take place. It's gonna be the radar because it's the most accurate. So when we talk about Bendix Fusion, it basically comes down to this. I've got a radar doing an extremely accurate distance calculation, relative velocity of the vehicle ahead, and it's independent of visibility. I can see through snow, ice, and fog. But what a radar doesn't do so well is very precise lane relevance. Where is it exactly directly ahead of me within a meter or within, uh, you know, five or six feet either side? The object size, right? I'm sending a splash of radar signal out and getting the radar signal back. It doesn't really contextualize or shape it, although the newer radars are getting much better. They're putting shape to it. Radars are getting smarter. They can kind of detect more of what's ahead of them, but it's still not deadly accurate. Uh, the object elevation, am I right at the road level or is this thing that I'm reflecting off of higher or lower? And then finally, object classification. Now when I include the camera, I get a different set of data. Now the camera, again, the words that I use, right? When the camera is showing this and we're looking at this at the screen, the camera has no clue what these little white puppy things are, or what this, you know, what it's done is it's, it's going to be able to compute on what I told it to look for. So we've told it to look for the shape of the back end of the car, two taillights, the license plate, a bumper, height of the bumper, uh, a shadow line, shape of the rear window. Right? We can classify what that object is, the back of a trailer, a couple of taillights, a bumper. So now the camera identifies that this is a car directly ahead of me. It confirms that the radar says, hey, listen, I see something reflected in my path. The camera confirms it's a car. And so we make decisions a lot sooner than when we were just a radar-based system versus a fused radar and camera, our stopping distances now and the rate at which we do the stopping happen way earlier than we did with just the radar based systems. So now I've got two sources of information. <coughs> uh, one thing I want to back up, oops, forgot this part. So when the drivers usually get this, right, and again, I think I mentioned it, let me go through it again. Most important thing you can do if you're fleet considering this is driver training, driver training, driver training. Offer them some orientation. Um, it's important for them to understand what the system is doing, why it's giving them these messages. So, uh, you know, there's, we've got 15 minute videos. You know, if you're at a dealership, you could give the keys to the owner. If it's an owner operator, have to sit in the lunch room, buy a copy, let them watch an orientation video. From a fleet's perspective, we've got videos we can show them. I can't tell you how many uh, 
Facebook videos I'm on at Fleets where I've gone in and done driver training and they filmed it with an Apple iPhone. So that becomes your orientation video. Once the drivers understand what the system's alerting and doing, the rate of acceptance of the systems go up higher. But uh, so it's important for training. Now, radar. What the radar is doing is that we look for two things. Not so much that I can see a reflective object, but this object needs to be moving. Right? So if I'm driving down the road and I've got something steel in front of me and it's not moving, radar has no clue what it is. So we give the, the driver a message called stationary object alert. We'll go through that in a couple of slides. But the main um, detection method for the radar to know if there's something ahead is that it's steel and it has to be moving. So when the driver comes in, he just got his new vehicle, he's unsure of it, the system's beeping, he says, well, the brakes are coming on every time I go through an overpass or I hit a rock cut door, it sees a stop sign and the brakes are coming on, and it's not. Right? The radar's looking for movement of this object, it's got to have a certain, or there are other factors, but generally it's a reflective object and it has to be moving. So get back to this slide real quick, right? And I've got the radar doing its work for accurate calculation. I have the camera now that I've programmed to look for certain characteristics when I combine both those items. Right? I've got a system that detects and reacts a lot quicker than just a simple radar system. Here's a couple of examples. That's the other part that we've got to make sure the drivers understand. So this piece of artwork, let's assume I start from up here and I'm ripping off of an exit ramp and I'm getting onto the highway. Off an exit ramp coming onto the highway, but it's stormy or it's foggy, and the driver has got virtually very low visibility, can't see past this area. Hey, Pierre, so, can I interrupt you just for a minute? Please. I'm not sure if your microphone's close enough to you or not. It's we're, we're not getting a very good clear up right at the moment. Okay. Let me move it a little closer. I haven't touched anything. How's that? Is that a little better? Yeah, that's a little better. It almost sounds like we're getting feed from your computer fan in the background, too, maybe. Uh, you know what? That could be the case. Okay, sorry about that. Oh, I just lost my signal. Wait a minute. Hold on. Okay. Can you see my screen? I can, yep. Okay, can you hear me a little better? Uh, we can hear your fan pretty good, actually. Yeah, I'm, I'm quite far away. I don't know if it's that. You're throwing the fan on my model. All right, let me try to talk through this. So, um, the sample, and everybody's mic is turned off, presumably, right? Yeah. So the, um, the premise here is I'm coming off the ramp. My visibility is very low. So as we get off the ramp, the radar immediately detects a stationary object, right? This row of traffic isn't moving. The radar picks up. It says, I see something steel in my pass, but it's not moving. I have no idea what it is. The driver will get what's called a stationary object warning. The Bendix system won't break unless it completely identifies what it is. It's steel, knows that, but it's not moving, so it doesn't know if it's a car. It could be a case of pot, you know what I mean? So we give the driver. Drivers have to understand when they see stationary object warning, they've got three and a half seconds to react. Slow down, get out of the way, but there's something directly ahead of you. Three and a half seconds to do something. If I use the same example, but now it's clear day or it's at night, right? The headlights come in, I come off the exit ramp, I encounter a row of stop traffic, the radar sees stop traffic, but now the camera identifies taillights, lights, everything's fine. The radar may say, geez, it's not moving, but the camera confirms that it's a vehicle. So the system will stop, will do stationary vehicle braking based on those two bits of information. So the camera plays a key role when we can do stationary braking on the vehicle, as long as the camera can see the object ahead. And that was a huge uh, boon and increase in performance. Um, this example, I'll use the same thing. Nice clear day. I come ripping off the ramp. Our vehicles are stopped, but look at the difference. Now the camera doesn't see very well the taillights. We can't identify that object clearly. We're going to give the driver a stationary object alert. And remember, when all this stuff is happening, once the radar picks up a target and sees that the vehicle's moving towards this, we are alerting the driver in the data. We're giving the first alert, giving the second alert. They get too close, they get the collision mitigation alert. At that point, they should have you know, both hands on the steering wheel braking, getting out of the way, paying attention. So, but these systems here again, it's the issue of stationary object warning. Make sure the drivers understand when they see this, they're usually in a condition where their visibility is very poor, but the system is picking up vehicles ahead. Uh, the, the story I get the most from drivers, and they're typically not the type that'll come out and tell you when they had a little bit of a harrowing experience. Is they'll be driving on the road, bad road conditions, everything's fine, they've kind of settled into a groove, all of a sudden the dash lights up like a Christmas tree with a stationary object alert, 
and sure enough, they've, they've caught up to a trailer or a row of traffic that's stopped dead for whatever reason right on the main highway. That's probably the most common thing that I hear. So, you know, because the radar can see through all of that, but the benefit of the camera plays a key role to this. So stationary object alert, piece of training, we have to make sure our drivers understand and know what to do and how to react. I've got three quick slides I'm going to buzz through here. So these are just situations that call false alerts, right? So a radar is a radar, and it's looking straight ahead. It's not connected, at least right now, to the action of the, uh, the steering wheel. Sorry about that. So here we've got the circumstance where the truck is ripping down. He's in the center lane, passing vehicles. But you can see the output of the radar, right? I'm picking up, as I go through the apex of the curve, I'm picking up this reflective object, and it's moving. So the radar says, hey, I see a part of a car. It may pull throttle for one or two seconds or slow the vehicle down to get matching speeds for both. It'll last just a couple of seconds, depending on the, the length of the curve. But these are circumstances that let the driver know you're going to see this. The next one, and this one, it doesn't take much to get used to, but you can understand what's going on, right? So when we're in our own vehicles and we're driving down the road and, and we're catching up to a car and the car recognizes that we're coming, but they slowly make a lane change to the right or to the left. Um, and intuitively today, we know, well, listen, by the time I get to that car, he'll have gotten out of the lane. So I just keep accelerating, getting closer and closer as that vehicle moves to the side. Even if the radar is picking up just a portion of that reflected moving object, he's going to treat it like a full obstacle. And we'll maintain that distance. It'll slow the vehicle down. It'll warn the driver. So anything partial on their path, the driver will get notification. Right? So partially inside the lane of travel. Uh, okay, so this is probably the one I spent was the one I spend most time with with drivers. Right? So we're governed speed in our country. Um, well, the drivers are used to pulling up fairly close to the target ahead before they make a lane change, initiate that lane change, and start passing. So what collision mitigation does with the radar, right? If they get way too close to the vehicle ahead or another tractor trailer ahead of them, I'm going to start fighting them. Right? When they hit that first alert, second alert, they continue to try to get closer to it and start pulling throttle and doing all those things. So the drivers within an hour or so of driving the, their, their new vehicle, they'll learn very quickly with the limit that they can get close to, initiate the lane change and begin to pass. So, you know, that's just a function of how the radar works. There's no turning a feature off when I want to go past somebody. They've got to maintain that distance between them and the target vehicle ahead. Okay, and then this is the false one. It kind of goes back to that lane change, right? So. And intuitively in our car, we're catching up. We can see a vehicle's making a right-hand turn. It's going to get out of our way. We continue at the same speed knowing, again, intuitively I'll be past it by the time I get there. But here the radar is watching. As long as it picks up, even a portion of that reflective object that was moving, it's going to treat it like a full option. So slow down, maintain that gap in traffic. All right, so what makes Fusion work, right? It's the connection and the, the two data points that I talked about coming from the camera and from the radar which why we call it fusion, right? And it's all tied into Bendix ESP full stability. <clears throat> Just a reminder, in the model years 2017, at least for the vehicles that we run, there are exclusions, but under CMVSS 136, basically a six by four tractor will come standard, can't be spec'd off, it's required to have a full electronic stability system. So the electronic stability system is that technology that allows us to apply independent brakes on the individual corners of the vehicle, if it's success XM, it has a yawn lateral accelerometer, so it gives us good lateral and forward stability. But, you know, that's the, the basic uh, workhorse of these collision mitigation systems. I'm going to skip over now and go to a panel. I talked about an active system. We've been talking about fusion and radar. That's active. The systems intervene automatically. Uh, the Bendix blind spotter is a passive system. So we warn the driver. We give them notifications. We don't apply the brake. We don't pull throttle. We don't do anything. This is a, an inactive system been around for a long time is basically the genesis of the technology it goes back to the war ad it's just been updated so this little side radar is like a big hockey puck mounted on the side typically you see them in fairings just you know behind the door over here and then there's a um, little indicator that's bolted to the b-pillar so when the driver's out looking through his side mirror and his peripheral vision there's a little indicator light over here so it you know, provides continuous monitoring of the vehicle for approaching blind spots and service. So if you've got a fleet that already has blind spotter one, what I'm going to show you today is the updated version blind spotter two fits in the same hole, but it comes with added benefits. So here's a basic operation. When things are normal, 
driver looks over to his mirror, the yellow, the light is yellow, things are fine. The driver looks over his mirror, now it's red. And if he throws his right signal light, a tone will sound to tell him that there's an obstacle on the side of the trailer. The new blind spotter too, what you know, the, the first set of slides that I showed you was just if you look at the wiring harness, it's it's power and ground, and I got one connection to the right side signal. The latest one now is CAN connected, so now I can get information from the vehicle and I can change the sensitivity of that side radar. So my zone has increased dramatically. Uh, when I'm running on the highway, I have a higher zone, or a, excuse me, a greater zone that I'm looking at. So that's the high speed filtered out stationary objects. I'm not picking up guardrails or light poles. But when I get into slow speeds and parking lots and city driving, I now narrow my focus and looking for side objects. So it's looking, but as soon as the driver throws the right signal light, that's when the alerts come. And because it's hooked up to the can, we have OEMs now that are foregoing that little uh, indicator device on the B pillar and putting it all on the HMI and electronic dash. So, but again, it's still a passive system. It does not apply the brake, doesn't touch a throttle, it's just a warning system. Okay, so what I've gone through at this point, just doing a time check here, um, are the, the basis and the premise for a collision mitigation system. But as I said, these technologies evolve over time. They get smarter. You can get them to do more things. Hardware gets better. What I'm going to walk you through now are technologies that started getting rolled out in 2019, becoming more available 2021 and then 22, 23, right? So there's an evolution depending on the OE platform, on who the truck builder is, to what degree they have these uh, feature sets released. Right now we're into uh, winter testing up in Houghton, Michigan. Our, our test track is TRC in Ohio for the summer and the winter we're up in Houghton. And we've got a whole uh, flotilla of trucks from different vehicle OEs with their engineering staff doing final qualifications for some feature sets to be released later in the year. So what we've got here are new feature sets. I'm going to run through them real quick. I'm going to buzz through some of these slides. Uh, right. So just you know, I'm going to go through them slide by slide, but the, the, the wingman system up until 2019 had all these features that we're showing here in black. The enhanced feature sets, which add little to the hardware, but it's different hardware, it's smarter, and a different algorithm and software, we start adding all of this new capability. All right, so let me start with the first one. Enhanced autonomous emergency braking, speed reduction of 50. So if you've been in a vehicle that's had collision mitigation going back to 08, um, the we scrub about 35 mile an hour in speed, 30 to 30 mile an hour speed. It's been like that since 08, right up until 2019, or 27, 2018 and a half or so. Right, so that, when I say it, it doesn't mean that it takes it from uh, 80 down to 45, right? So, but the rate of deceleration revolve or involves uh, so many factors, right? It's all physics. It's the utilization of the tire, um, you know, forward velocity, all those things. But basically, the way the system was set up is to scrub a significant amount of speed off the vehicle. The latest version now, with the speed reduction up to 50, we're into full pneumatic air braking. So the collision is imminent. The, uh, the closing rate from the host vehicle, me and the truck, to the target vehicle ahead, I, I basically have access to full air pressure on the tractor to slam and make a hard break. It was limited with the prior system. It's increased dramatically with the new system. So if confidence grows, better radars, better cameras, now we're confident enough that we can provide full braking capability. So this is a big enhancement. The next one is multi-lane autonomous emergency braking. So what that means is prior to last year, if I was driving and an event occurred directly ahead of me, right? I'm driving, all of a sudden a car piles up in front, right? And so the radar is picking up the action and the activity ahead. I've got reflective steel parts that are there that were moving, now they're stopped. So the system's reacting to that ahead. If I make a lane change, now the radar basically loses that signal ahead and then picks up whatever's happening on the left or right of the vehicle. With the new multi-lane autonomous emergency braking, that's where the camera comes into play and the field of focus of the radar is expanded. It's constantly monitoring what's happening, what you and I would call to the left or right of the lane ahead of us, but it's monitoring outside of its typical realm and scope. So if an incident occurs directly in front of the vehicle in the lane of travel, and the driver makes an evasive turn to the left or to the right, it's already been monitoring what's happening on that side. It's either going to allow the driver to make a full brake application, or you know, so it's going to react. There's no five, six, ten millisecond lag for the system to re-engage what's happening as it's did the move outside of the lane. So it's constantly a monitoring multi-lane. Big, big improvement. 
Highway Departure, this is new. And again, now these feature sets that I'm going through with you now as we speak here today in 2021, uh, you'll need to sit with your OEM nameplate, right? So we're released everywhere except for Freightliner. Um, so, you know, when you go talk to them, have an understanding because each OE is releasing these at different schedules. Some have it all, others have 80% of them. So my point is uh, when you're done, get a hold of Wayne Thomas. He can let you know depending on the OE you're working with, he'll work with the new sales. Uh, highway departure warning braking. So here I've got a driver that either has really fallen asleep, right? So we have lane departure warning. Remember I played that speaker the minute the width of the front tire or the center line of the bogey's cross the line, we get that aggravating rumble strip sound. Um, there is, there are a couple of truck OEs that you can get fusion collision mitigation. However, they have um, didn't take the lane departure feature, so there's no lane departure. What this technology does, if the truck waves over, crosses the line. Um, either we give a lane departure warning or not, depending on the system. When both wheels cross the line, uh, we give the warning, the system's going off, if the driver's incapacitated, we start to lower and apply the brake to reduce the vehicle speed. Right, so may not stop a tip over, but it'll dramatically reduce the amount of energy that's involved in this incident. So that's highway departure warning. That's a good feature set to have. Doesn't add any hardware, just an increase in computing power. Now we get into the kind of cool things I like these adaptive crews with braking. So if we look at the basic system today, when I put my, it's very much like our cars, I put the cruise control on, I'm buzzing down the highway, and then a four wheeler kind of cuts me off, or you know, I have to step on the brake because I've got something ahead of me. The minute I step on the brake, my cruise control is disengaged. So I have to go ahead and the, hit the reset button so the cruise comes back to my reset speed. <clears throat> what active cruise with braking does with auto resume is that I have a vehicle come ahead of me. Uh, the system intervenes, but it says, geez, I got to put the brakes on. This is the, the electronic system puts the brake on. The minute the obstacle goes away, the system will turn on again without the driver having to reset. Now, the um, auto cruise or the auto resume works down to whatever the set speed is for cruise. So in my personal vehicle, I can try to play with the cruise control, but until I hit 40 kilometers an hour, then I hit the cruise button and it engages. So this technology wouldn't let me engage below 40 clicks an hour, as an example. And that set speed will vary from OE to OE. So active cruise with braking, auto resume, good feature. The system's in cruise control, the brakes are applied by the system, it'll automatically check, catch up again once the obstacle ahead of it is out of its way. Uh, now this is stop and go. So it's active cruise with braking, but now this uh, part of the technology will let the truck come right down. So it's been in cruise control and the driver's in moderate to heavy track and he's ebb and flow. He started at 100 uh, somewhere in town and as the traffic built up, the traffic slowed down, slowed down. And we're maintaining a following distance. The system is keeping him safe. If the traffic comes to a stop, the vehicle will come right down to a stop. Now if it's more than three seconds, the whole system kicks off. But within three seconds, if the traffic starts moving again, the driver just taps the throttle and the system will re-engage and then begin to accelerate. Of course, the amount of acceleration is based on the target vehicle ahead and the distance and all those things, but stop and go is a really big feature improvement. <coughs> and so that concludes the feature set. That's where we're at again, depending on your vehicle OEM of choice, go talk with them, meet with your um, new truck salesperson. So we talked about collision mitigation. How are we doing with the time mark? We're good. Uh, talk about collision mitigation. Now, as we start moving, we're at the, the you know, when you look at ADOS, so driver assistance systems, essentially there's there's been a system set up between level one and level five. We're dealing in level one. When you start taking control of steering, that moves you to the beginning of a level two ADOS system. Um, so now I'm going to talk about the inclusion of steering control. So you notice how we've got Shepard Active Steering by Bendix. Uh, Bendix has been in the steering business for about five, six years now. We started off with the acquisition of a TE drive. I'll step back a little bit. Actually, in my junior years with Bendix back in the 90s, um, I was an account manager for a big truck OE, and they had factories in South America. And uh, we had a steering gear back then, uh, medium and heavy duty, C300, C500 steering gear. Uh, we exited that business, sold it, and come full circle in 2014, we acquire a business. I look at the steering gear, and gee, that looks familiar. Yeah, it's ours. So the company who bought it, we bought TE Drive. Uh, so it's a steering gear, reciprocating ball steering gear, but their expertise lies in a magnetic torque overlay technology, the ability to steer the vehicle without servo motors. So we acquired TE Drive for that. And then uh, about three years ago, we acquired a software company that 
is strictly and uniquely involved in developing artificial intelligence for, for level four and level five autonomous vehicle steering, medium heavy duty. So now we've got uh, those patents and that capability. We went out and purchased two big steering uh, companies in Europe, uh, Mitsubishi being the big one uh, for medium duty and some heavy duty application. As a matter of fact, Mitsubishi, we've got one North American truck builder we're all familiar with, will be using that Mitsubishi gear or Hitachi. Wayne, what is it? Is it Mitsubishi? No, it's Hitachi. The Hitachi gear goes into production on a Class 8 truck later on this year. Um, and then we acquired a company called Pro Diesel. Pro Diesel is a national rebuilder, right? You can't have OE gear steering, so we have to support the aftermarket. We acquired it's now a Bendix, so we have a huge remanufacturing, 95% coverage for remanufactured gear through the Bendix product group. Sorry, I'm leading up to this. And then in January, we acquired Shepard. Shepard um, is one of the key steering gear providers to the OEM in North America. It's been around for 80 years. Uh, we acquired them. Um, we made the announcement in January, it became final in April. We have factories all through Pennsylvania, a few in North Carolina, um, quite the foundries. So uh, we now partnered up with Shepard, or acquired Shepard, and using their technology, what we brought in, we now have a steering gear called a Shepard Active Steering by Bendix. So what I'm showing you now is what's released at NowStar. I've got a good slide set on that, but it gives you an idea how steering now gets included in this collision mitigation technology. So why is steering important? Again, you know, you get the slide, I reference where we collected the data from, FMCSA, the government. 34.8%, and this is not just pass card, these are large truck causation crashes. 34.8% of the crashes with property damage caused by site swipes. Close to 50% fatal crashes were in two-way undivided traffic, right? So small two-way roads, truck, or, you know, trucker car across the lanes. And then 27.2 fatal crashes occurred at an angle in some way, shape, or form. So it's a loss of control. Again, these are uh, not past card, but uh, large truck population uh, studies that were done. I think that this was 2018. Yeah, so again, you've seen that slide. Okay. Let's do that. So, very quickly, just a quick recap on the Shepherd, right? They're a global supplier over 60 years of steering. As it stood right now, we have got a little 40% market share in North America for steering gear. And they're everything in the steering gear, tip and arms, miter box, steering columns. Uh, it just complements our aftermarket coverage, which I just went through, and some of the technologies and production based out of Japan as well. All right, so this is what electronic steering basically looks like. So for us, we had actually picked up the patents from TE Drive for magnetic torque overlay. So now we're controlling hydraulic pressure in the steering gear to manipulate the steering, right, the steering wheel. So the basic setup is, is we have another cat on a computer. Yeah, you can crank, it's another computer in the truck. So there's a cat mounted computer um, connected to a coil on the steering here. You can see there's no servo motors. Not that servo motors are bad. We have uh, another truck OE that uses, I think it's a Bosch twin servo motor. We're in development now and out field testing servo motors. So there's applications for electric motors. The problem with electric motors is they draw a lot of amperage. The big load on the electrical circuit of the truck. These magnetic torque overlays with control and pressure is very, very little low electrical demand. So I've got an ECU, and uh, all of the information is going to be pushed through the OEM's HMI, through their electronic dash. But look what's doing all the work, right? So it's our camera, right? Written in machine language. Now we apply some AI functionality to the camera, situationally positioning the vehicle in the road. And then, you know, for those of you who think, well, if you're controlling the vehicle, the driver is ultimately in control. If he just touches the steering wheel less than a half a, de or a degree, a little less than one degree, that disables these uh, functions that I'm going to show you here in a few minutes. So the steering, allen, the steering angle uh, sensor is already incorporated for ESP. Right? So when I went from an ABS system to a traction control system, and then when I incorporated ESP, I included a handful of uh, extra sensors. I included a lateral, and yaw, uh, lateral accelerometer and yaw sensor. That's one box. I added steering angle sensor, right? So predictability, what the driver's doing with the steering wheel and some pressure demand sensors. So the input that's already there for my steering angle sensor, I have it talk to the ECU, get input from the camera, the driver intervenes, touches the steering wheel, it disables the system. So magnetic torque overlay, right? Forward looking camera, these are the main drivers. Here's what the steering gear looks like. In our case, our launch product was the HD94. It's uh, released at Navistar now. It adds about six pounds, yeah, 2.3 kg to the weight. Steering gear looks very much like, again, it's based on an HD94, very common steering gear. But the brains are back into here. 
right? So that's the magnetic torque overlay that's added to the casting. Low power requirement to manipulate the valve. These are the feature sets that you see with an assisted driving or active steering system. You get lane keep assist, and I go through these very quickly one after the other. But these are the five benefits that a driver can encounter. So lane keep assist, right? Helps mitigate collisions and traffic with parallel lines. Adds corrective torque at 35 miles an hour and above. So we're not going to play with the steering if the driver is you know, in the city and all things are happening. And just a reminder too, and I, I didn't mention this earlier, when we look at standard lane departure, right, the first five slides I went through, and I said, you know, there's a kill switch to turn it off if uh, too many painted lines. Uh, the, the lane departure system itself will not come on until the vehicle speed gets to above 60 kilometers an hour. Right? So we don't want the system firing off when we're in the yard because of the some painted lines they're in city traffic. So the standard default setting for lane departure, 60 clicks and above, then the system energizes for lane departure. Well, this system is set up off the same switch. This is what the switch looks like on the dash. Again, when you send your customer out, it does not have to have system steering, but it'll have this lane departure switch. Look for this thing, it's voluntary to the driver. All right, so within the context of active steering, right? So we add corrective torque above 60 kilometers an hour. The driver must keep the hands on the wheel override at any time. Now, this is a bit of a tricky state of mind. There are no sensors in the steering wheel. Virtually every OE that we know of is working on sensors in the wheel, so the driver doesn't take his hands off the wheel. You can see that on Tesla and other vehicles where drivers keep their hands off. We rely on any movement from the driver coming from steering column position sensors, the SAS, and uh, inputs you know, from the camera. So the driver must keep his hand on the wheel and there's this on-off switch. If you find themselves in an operational condition that they don't want the system on, they disable it for 15 minutes, very much like the, uh, the LDW system. So it's speed-dependent steering. This is very cool. You get to try it. I mean, Wayne's been at it. I've been trying it as well. So when you're at highway speeds, 100 kilometers an hour, uh, there's there's effort required to turn the wheel. Right? I mean, I'm embarrassed to say I've got you know, more sports cars than I should have had. But the steering is really twitchy. They're super sensitive, especially when it was doing rally racing. You know, at high speeds, it was tricky. The wheel was very sensitive. On these systems, it's speed dependent. The faster the vehicle is going, the less steering assist you're going to get out of it. And at low speeds, when they're in the, in the city or in the yard, you, the driver gets a lot more assistance. Um, if you have a minute, go to YouTube and type in Bendix Live Demo. <laughs> You can watch it, it's about an hour long, but about halfway through, we do one part of the demonstration. You can see how Fred, our, uh, the guy who's hosting this thing, with one finger, he's doing 90 degree turn with a tractor trailer, 40,000 pounds in the trailer. One finger effort to turn the steering wheel at, speed, at low speed. But then as the vehicle increases in speed, the, the field gets a lot firmer. So, low, so it's speed dependent. You can see there are two different profiles. What we found is profile one, is one that the drivers like. Profile two is a little more aggressive, but here again, you know, they've got some options to choose. Uh, active return to center. Again, that's very good when you're in a in a yard condition, low speeds, trying to maneuver, right? So you can have the steering wheel go to center. Again, if you let go of the wheel and it returns to center, the driver doesn't want it. Many puts his finger on the steering wheel, everything stops the systems. But left alone, the steering wheel will return to center. So that active uh, return to center is a feature that's included with that. Getting through the end of it here. A side wind and road uh, crown compensation. Right? So you're running across the ferries, you get a lot of side wind. It's not much, but driver effort is required to keep the wheel, vehicle tracking straight or high crown in the road. This system will dramatically reduce that effort from the driver, and it's noticeable. And then finally, road disturbance. And this was kind of freaky. I've talked to, I brought several fleets in at our demo track. So you're driving, we run them through a course that has lots of bumps, right? And then we turn the system on and there's very little that radiates up through the steering wheel. It's not gonna, it's not gonna stop everything. But there's a really noticeable reduction in vibration and, and they're not near as strong as they would be with the system turned on. So again, it's got a different feel to it. So in this case, Navistar is our launch customer. It's available now, All right? That's the Shepard, um, order code on the Navistar platform, but you can see, I put this in so you can notice, right, you can get Wingman Fusion, some fleets want it with uh, adaptive cruise stop and go driver, others don't want stop and go driver, right, so you've got different order codes depending on the level of performance you want with the mitigation system, and then to add active steering, that's a standalone code. Now, the difference with these technologies, 
is that when you buy a Bendix wingman system, you're buying the Bendix hardware, it's integrated on the vehicle. Steering and other technologies that are coming are more agnostic in that I run on an open source. So if I have another collision mitigation system and it's a Bendix Shepard steering gear, they talk and they work together. So the steering gear, like I said, it's agnostic and work with other systems and they do work with other systems. Yeah, so I've gone through collision mitigation. I've only got a few more slides left. I wanted to at least take some time to go through to show you what's coming near term, right? The next 12, 24 months. So the traditional yellow and red button, the MV3 parking button, are slowly going to phase out. We've been talking about this product for several years, and, and you know, fire got lit underneath it. And so now it's moving um, with release dates at pretty much all OEMs. But what this thing is, and I think, uh, and I use the term, it's not a dirty little secret, but just think on how many incidents occur in the yard where the driver exits the vehicle and forgets to park the vehicle, right? So it's roll away crashes because the yellow button wasn't pushed. So these now, they're electric, but they're all set up with interlocks. So instead of having like an MV3 plunger with all the airlines coming into the dash, now it's got its own computer. Yeah, the dirty word again, another ECU. Um, and then this uh, cluster of solenoids, these aren't new inventions. We've been selling solenoids for better than 10 years from other devices on the vehicle. Um, and these are latching solenoids for safety, right? So if you lose power, the system's not going to activate. But the way the interlocks are set up, and I'll give you an example of how this thing's going to work. So I'm the driver, I'm in the yard, I backed up, and I get open the door, and I don't pull the yellow button. So the interlock could be when the door opens, the system will ignite. Of course, we're looking at ABS wheel speed signals, right? There has to be zero speed when these interlocks come into play. Uh, we've got one OEM, for example, that says, uh, I'm the driver, I have to sit in, I have to be sitting on the seat, the door has to be closed, my seat belt has to be plugged on, and my foot on the brake pedal. The door closed, seat belt on, foot on the brake pedal, then I can push the yellow button and the brakes will release. Those other three conditions aren't met, the brake won't release. That's extreme. I've got another OE just basically says, well, okay, put on the brake and that's enough. Good. So these are configurable, but the idea of an interlock at the end of the day is if the door opens and the butt comes off the seat, those two interlocks will fire the yellow button. It also looks at where a driver starts to pull away, he may have released the yellow button, but he never parked the, or never unparked the trailer. So we can detect when the tractor's moving instead of dragging, sorry, instead of dragging the trailer, it'll automatically release the brakes on the trailer. So the whole feature of IntelliPark now, it's the electrification, you know, reducing the amount of airlines coming into it. This is coming, really kind of slick. Uh, so it's an OE install, it'll be plugged into the HMI. There's much more features, but I wanted to just kind of bounce it around so you have the flavor for, you know, what, the, what direction we're going away from there, more to electric and some of these control and smart intelligent devices. This little thing down here that looks like a mesh thermostat, that's for an aftermarket installation. So a new truck is going to have this on the dash. That's the driver interface. Um, but there's been a lot of demand to do aftermarket installation. I think we're going to start third quarter this year. And now you're going to need some way to display that's what this thing is for. Um, and again, I'm, I'm not going to go through these all, but you know, help prevent personal injury, roll away mitigation, smart on park, trailer brake release, electric switches, etc. So. There's a series of interlocks and programming that can be done to dramatically mitigate the risk of a rollaway crash. And again, we've had it for a while, we've been promoting it now, something lit a, lit a fire, virtually all the OEs have some, all but one OE, uh, the other ones all have some program plan to release it. But I would anticipate, and Wayne, I'll let you jump in here, I think it's more of a 2022 second quarter, third quarter before the OEs hit it. But there's some demand from fleets they want it now. So, but uh, we're talking into next year, but it's coming now. Uh, so, this is what an aftermarket kit would look like parts in the box, special set of instruction harnesses with the display. And the OEM would just need to get you know, these two components electromagnetic, solenoids, oh, control, and air pressure. Sorry, I was on double the end here. Okay, no, we're good. Um, uh, so essentially, this will conclude. I've got two more things I want to cover with you, but at this point, I'm finished talking electronics. I have a couple of quick service items I want to go through with you now that I've got, you know, a group from the industry on the phone. It's just a heads up. 
so this is a new air dryer. That's not the big deal. Uh, what we're starting to see with air dryers now, there's somewhat of a shift. So what you should have heard by now is the inclusion of coalescing filter technology. So virtually every truck OE that's shipping today has a coalescing, coalescing filter, right? It's a high degree of filtration for the system. It was one thing, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, you know, I could pop an R12 or an R14 relay valve, spend 60 bucks and put it on. But now with all of the mechatronics that we find on our trucks, right? Electronic or electro-pneumatic dosing systems, EGR control systems for electro-pneumatic, uh, AMT, mechatronic headwear controllers, three, $4,000 replacement, uh, multi-channel EBS systems on the trailer. It's not a $50 relay valve, now it's a $2,000 replacement EBS valve. So the amount of cleanliness in the air has become a big deal. And what's happening on all of these big vendors who provide these small mechatronic control components, they're backing away more and more when the failure mode of these things are purely contaminated air systems. Well, all the truck OEs are shipping with some form of a coalescing air dryer. So what's come out now, this, our new one, it's, it's a variant of the ADIS. We just did a big design change, cast body, it's repairable. Get a hold of my angle, we'll do through, we'll go through feature and benefit changes, they're repairable. I wanted you to take note of this, 41 millimeter. There's been a global standard for over 20 years for the spin-on cartridge. There's been a 39 millimeter thread, and, you know, you can buy them from uh, 50 different vendors and different degrees of drying. Um, so the OEs are a little bit freaked out on the amount of warranty costs for these contaminated air systems with all these variety of different dryers are being installed. So uh, with our launch customer, they said, listen, you, you know, you got to give me something different. So we created the same, only one style of cartridge with a coalescing element, but it's not 39, it's 41. So a technician doesn't just grab a filter that he's been using forever and threw it on. Uh, this one is 41 mil, it won't fit. Uh, I have a competitor that makes air dryers as well. They've taken the same approach. They stayed at 39 millimeter, but they have a patent in the thread, right? They've changed the pitch angle. So when you take this new cartridge, you go to thread it onto the dryer that you've been using, it, it almost feels like it's cross-threading. That's done intentionally because they're forcing, the OEs are forcing to ensure that the correct desiccant cartridge is going on the vehicle to ensure maximum amount of cleanliness because the amount of warranty now obligation from the individual component supplier of those mechatronic components is diminishing, they're pushing back more. So just cautionary note, I put this in because it's new, 41 mil, and you have the other air dryer guy doing different thread pitches. The reason why they're doing that is because the amount of liability and the, the degree of clean air. Uh, my story's always been, if you've got brand X dryer, make sure you use a brand X cartridge, it completely fixes it. This is not the time to, to, to save 40 bucks and have to spend 3,000 for a replacement control company. So these changes to air dryers are coming. If I look out to 2024, new code name ours, GSAT, there's a whole new family of dryers that are coming, all of the OEMs. And, and again, I don't know of one that's not doing it. It takes the next step to the electrification of the brake system. The D2 governor is gonna go away. You know, we want the dryer talking to the engine. It's gonna control how the compressor loads and unloads. Um, that's coming in a couple of years. And then not much beyond that, we start to see the inclusion of um, the beginning introduction of EBS componentry. So the air brakes are still gonna be there. We're still gonna have an S-cam brake or an air disc brake, but the control signals coming from the foot valve are gonna be piggybacks. It'll be electronic, it'll still be a piggyback of the pneumatic system. But it's a slow movement, looking very much like a European system where it's brake by wire. Again, still air pressure to do all the work, still an air disc brake, still an S-cam brake, but the control valves themselves that create these things are gonna be electronic, all on canvas. Um, and at that point, I, I'm going to leave this up to Mark. So I've got three slides left. I always keep this in here. There's really somebody in the crowd who's had some experience with collision mitigation. Uh, then these next couple of slides, and I'll leave it to Mark to let me go. It takes me about eight minutes to get through them. It talks about probably the driver's biggest concern when they end up with a vehicle with collision mitigation and put snow and icy and the brakes come on. So Mark, if we've got time, I can go through them. If not, I'll kind of stop everything here and, and take some questions or comments. We, we have time. Do so you want me to go through this? Okay. Yeah. So this this set of slides, I'm talking about electronic stability, but when a fleet first introduces, sorry, when the fleet first introduces collision mitigation, right, again, I, I can't emphasize this enough. Make sure you've got some orientation plan. Go to the dealer, he's got videos he can provide for you. Bring in the supplier of the collision mitigation system. 
you know, record them on your phone, but there's got to be some driver orientation. You'll have a really high rate of acceptance. But what usually happens is the driver's got their new vehicles, they're in traffic, it's the middle of summer, a four-wheeler, you know, we're going to go to the next one here. Four-wheeler comes in, jumps in front of the truck, the brakes automatically come on, and the mental leap that the drivers made was, oh my God, the brakes came on. What happens if this is the middle of winter? Now my roads are icy and slicey. I'm going to lose control of the truck. I'm not touching this thing in the wintertime. So the next uh, pieces of information I'm going to give you address that with drivers. So, I'm, and this is uniquely and exclusively about an EPS or the ESP stability. You can't get collision mitigation without ESP. So there's two parts of the technology that help us in this event. First is ABS, right? ABS, analog brake system. So the ABS by itself, most of our trailers at this point, we've aged out the units that don't have it. Um, so all the trailers and the tractors are equipped with ABS. Right? ABS, we want to modulate the brake apply. So if the driver steps on the brake hard, the wheel starts going to lock. As the wheel starts to lock up, we release the air pressure at the wheel, right? It's called the tip of the view slip curve, right? So it's maximum adhesion utilization. And then if we start having that wheel slip, the ABS system releases the air pressure, then it gives it back to them. So that's how we get the rate of modulation on the air brake system. So the ABS mitigates the wheel lockup. So if the wheels lock up, now we've got a set of skates instead of a set of tires. So EBS has done a good job historically. And again, it's gotten smarter, they're more sensitive. Um, to variability in wheel speed change, right? It's looking at wheel speed sensors. So ABS plays a key role in maintaining lateral stability of the vehicle going straight. Now we add ESP. So ESP of full electronic stability, again, can't buy a truck without it today. ESP does a couple of things. So it includes, in our case, we have it in one box. It's mounted on the center line of the chassis of the tractor, typically right behind a day cab. If you've got a sleeper, it's gonna be stuffed underneath. But there's a position that's on the vehicle and the OEs will dictate where that goes. So what does it do? So let's look at just a concrete road. I'm a driver, I hit the ramp, I come into it a bit too hot, I'm loaded, I may be top heavy. Tires are stuck to the road, but I get into the ramp too quick, now the thing starts to want to tip over. So imagine for a moment, as a driver, I've got a grandfather clock <laughs> behind me in the cab and the pendulum is just dangling, it's on the center line. And I get into that off ramp and I start to curve, the pendulum starts to move one way or the other, right? That's G-force. So the rate at which, so how much that pendulum moves and how fast it's moved, its rate of acceleration, will determine a roll event. And then if that occurs, all the brakes are applied. So dry asphalt and coming into a ramp too quick, the system sees that there's a pending tip over potentially. Now you'll see all the tires in blue. Right? That's a, all the brakes are applied, tractor and trailer automatically. That's a, a RSP event. Now we get into what ESP does very well. We add another sensor, the yaw sensor. So if you can imagine you're looking down, you're, you're in a drone and you're 100 feet above the tractor and you're staring down at the fifth wheel, what the yaw sensor is essentially doing, it's looking at the axial rotation of the tractor on its axis. So it's looking how it's rotating on itself. So the yaw sensor or the lateral accelerometer is looking for tip over. And now what the yaw sensor is doing, it's looking for oversteer or understeer, right? Jackknife or snow plowing is a good example. So if I start to jackknife coming up my ramp or if I turn the wheel and the truck keeps, keeps going straight, right? Oversteer, understeer. So this example, I'm coming off my ramp again, just like this, except the difference, it's the middle of February and everything's glare ice or got patched snow. So I get into it. So now there's a bunch of information that we know as the driver gets into the situation. Right? I've got my steering column position sensor that I mentioned earlier. The driver, so we're predicting what the driver's intention is. I've got a yaw sensor that's popping a voltage out that gives me the orientation, how far out of center line it is. I'm looking at speed voltages coming from the wheel speed sensor, inside the wheel turning a little slower than the outside wheel. We can model within milliseconds where the vehicle's going. And again, and again, I'm using this just as an example. What ESP is doing in this case is that it's only going to apply the left front brake and I'll pulse an air brake to the rear of the trailer. One, to get maximum deceleration based on the road condition, but two, not induce a jackman. So it's the combination of the ABS not letting the wheels lock up and then all of the extra sensors to completely uh, increase the loss of control of the vehicle. So this, this was an older video, and this is up in our test track in Houghton, Michigan. I'll show you two quick videos. There's a truck that has returned ESP off. It's a simple setup with A-frame. These little racks you see are load racks. They go to 15, 18,000 pounds of cast iron on it, but they're hydraulically controlled. I can raise that weight to raise the CG. Um, no ABS on the trailer. 
and just look real quick. A 20 degree, cur uh, 20 degree movement of the steering wheel is induced, and you can see how quickly everything gets out of sorts. Right? When I lose instability on the tractor, I'm turning. I love this video. Watch this chain banging over here. See that chain? It was supposed to be connected to the trailer. So when this happened, we've been the eight range. Anyways, let me go to this one. Same environment, the darker at night. Um, I induced, well, we induced a 20 degree steer event, but now the ESP is on. Trailers have to change. And you can hear the ch -ch 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 -ch, right? Those are the individual modulators that are popping to maintain levels. That's clear ice. That's worse case. And so if I can maintain stability on the tractor, in this train configuration will be enough. Hey, Pierre, we're losing your audio again. Yeah, it's because I have, there's a background sound. Sorry about that. Uh, okay. go back here. So what you notice on this video uh, with the ESP engaged, if I can keep the tractor from literally sliding, and that's what the ESP system is doing, it's using both the lateral accelerometer and the yaw sensor. I'm watching how much I'm, in, in, again, with the volume turned up, I could hear the individual modulators firing. I maintain stability on the truck, I get good control on the trailer. So the message I give to the drivers is just that, right? Either a four-wheeler comes in and cuts you off, and you've got to slam on the brake when the roads are slippery, or the system applies the brakes when the roads are slippery. You have the advantage of ABS and the full ESP system to dramatically mitigate the loss of control of the vehicle. And, um, you know, so it doesn't matter, again, if it's ABS uh, or, excuse me, if it's a driver-induced hard brake applied or a system-induced, the inclusion of ABS and ESP are really those that are going to keep the, the whole combination in control. Again, it comes down to road conditions, right? All this stuff that I'm talking about only works if I've got some bite of a tire onto the road. It's that little contact surface the size of a pie plate from the rubber to the surface, the coefficient of friction, condition of the, of the road and the tires, how good are my brakes, did I do the right brake job, am I using the right friction material, right? Everything starts to domino behind that. But control really happens with all of these extra sensors that are mounted on the vehicle. All right, so that will conclude my presentation. I'm going to show this last little bit of video. So here's my question. In this scenario, this truck if this truck would have had collision mitigation, so will, would the brakes that have applied automatically? What would have happened to your driver's So that's the question. Would the system have intervened automatically? Take a minute, write it in the notes file, and we'll see if I got the message across correctly or not. But uh, would the driver have to intervene, or would the system have intervened? At the end of this, I conclude my presentation. I really appreciate uh, your time for sitting in on this today. Any questions, again, I'll open up to the floor, and uh, you can write them in the chat line, and we'll get Wayne involved as well here. So, again, thank you. Thanks, Pierre. Appreciate that. Um, if there's any questions, go ahead, guys. Just pop them into the uh, chat box there, and I'll read them off to uh, Pierre and Wayne, and they can answer away for us. And while we're waiting for some to come in, if there are any, I want to thank you for taking the time to do it for us today. Uh, one thing for sure, the technicians have their hands full in front of them. <laughs> I think I got it. All right, maybe in the meantime, while we're waiting, oh, just hang on, maybe. In the meantime, while we're waiting, uh, if anybody's got some questions, go ahead and pop them in. Maybe I can get you to stop sharing your screen, Pierre, and I'll get uh, Jason to turn it over and he can do the draw for the gift card. <laughs> 